Hey, I'm so glad you're here to watch Live Church. This is not just a program. We pray to God that it's an encounter with Him, that in the worship and in the word that we share together today, that God would speak directly to your heart. He loves you so much, and we're trusting God for greater things to come in your life and for all those you love. Come on, let's get started together now.
take you to John chapter 10 and then put your seatbelts on because today we're going to go to John chapter 11 as well. And in John chapter 10, it's fascinating scripture that is our theme throughout this, but when we think about best life, what I wanted to focus on is when things go wrong, when you're in your best life. Because here we have this situation where someone comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, my brother is sick. In fact, he's so sick he's gonna die. That doesn't sound like best life, does it? Or maybe you've been up all night with a child that's been crying and you're thinking, I'm not sure this is my best life. Or maybe you're going through the motions in your career and you're thinking, really, is this my best life? Well, today I want to give you some ammunition that will work today and every day to help you achieve your best life. Today I want to go to a place where regardless of what you feel like and regardless of what your circumstances currently are, that you'll have enough in your fuel tank to get you through not only today, but propel you into your future. So come on, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the living word. And we thank you, God, today you will help us understand and apply your incredible principles that you gave us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Okay, let's go to John chapter 10. Let's go here. Now, this is what Jesus says, and, and what makes what he said so powerful is this. When Jesus said that I have come so that you may enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full so that it overflows. When Jesus said that, what makes that statement so powerful is not that he said it 2,000 years ago. So Jesus isn't saying he has come to give life 2,000 years ago. What makes it so important that we understand is that Jesus is saying that right now, today. Jesus is saying that I will come for each and every person who needs to discover life. Now that's the difference that separates out Christianity from every other kind of mere believing. That Jesus didn't just say it once. No, that Jesus will come to you in your hospital. Jesus will come to you in whatever you're going through in the darkest night of your soul, in the darkest tears of your night. Jesus will come to those who say, Jesus, I need you and I need you right now. And I'm so glad that by Jesus' resurrection power, he is still saying that at 2018 that he is saying at the outset of this year, he will come whenever you need him to come. I'm grateful for that. What about you? I'm so grateful for that. Now, after Jesus says this in John chapter 10, I have come, and as he's saying to these words, the very next chapter is John chapter 11. After he makes this incredible promise about life coming, he is interrupted in his journey, and this is where I'm going to start teaching today in John chapter 11. And as he's literally with his disciples, this is what happens in John chapter 11. A man named Lazarus was sick. Here we go. Here's the best life. Here's the best life situation, and now Jesus is dealing with a sick person. In the village of Mary and her sister Martha, there they lived. And the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the love you one is sick. Now, this, this doesn't sound like the best life. And if you're real and you have experienced some challenges and frustration, the best life does not immune you or keep you to a place where you are separate from the problems and, and, and challenges that affect people. We're gonna have trouble in this world. We're gonna have challenges. Some people said amen. I wish we could not say amen to that. We're gonna have things that go wrong. We're gonna have tough conversations. We're gonna have critical moments in our life. We're gonna have decisions where literally the decision we make can be the hinge that can turn our life around. We're gonna have these moments and I wanna speak into people so that in those moments that, that we're, just not, we're just not living out of a frustration or living out of a pipe dream or living out of a mere hope or mental ascent, no, no, no. And when Jesus starts to deal with this sickness, he's not just dealing with some kind of viral disease that's affecting the body. No, he is pointing out something that's so much deeper than that. 
He is pointing out not just that he can beat a sickness, because I've learned this, that, that a miracle, when a miracle comes, is not just a physical miracle. But I'll get to that later on. Let me get into this. Because as he says this, this sickness that happens, uh, look what happens in this. This is just, this is ridiculous because, because as it comes, Jesus says this. He says, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for God's glory and that God may be glorified through this. And then it goes on to say, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. I'm like, Jesus, what are you doing? Like someone's sick and they're about to die. And so you've decided not to deal with the situation for two more days. That meant that Mary and Martha, who had sent the message, had a big decision to make. And I love the Bible so much because it talks about ordinary situations and ordinary people. And I identify with that. I don't know about you, but I identify with the situation because I have prayed prayers and nothing's happened. I have sought God and it looks like in the natural that, that nothing yet has broken through. And so now I'm living in the gap between saying, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I'm confessing it. Now I'm living in the gap. And so I'm gonna give you three tools today to help you right where we are in our time of trouble. Now you might be riding high today. You might be thinking, I'm doing great at the outset of the year. My marriage is great, my family's great, or my college is going great or I'm doing so well in many areas of life, well, let me give you a tool for your tomorrow because you're gonna need it. You're gonna need it. One day, maybe February, or one day, maybe April, you're gonna need it. And so this is the tool I wanna first put into your toolkit this morning. The first toolkit I wanna, I wanna give you, the first wrench, the first hammer is this, and this is the principle. Be intentional. Be intentional. I want you to think about this because Jesus had visited Mary and Martha. He had visited them. He had spent time with them. And Mary and Martha had a track on Jesus. They knew where Jesus was. And so they sent a message, Jesus, my brother is sick. They could have only done that if they knew where he was and they knew what he was about. Are you keeping your track on Jesus intentionally? How's your prayer life going? How's your devotional life going? How's your fasting going? How are your conversations going? How is the company that you keep going? Are you doing the best that you can do to believe in Jesus? Because that intentionality will change everything around you. Mary and Martha were not random. They knew exactly where Jesus was. They sent a message, Jesus, we need you and you need, we need you right now. Where's your track on Jesus at? Because intentionality means that if we keep a track today on where Jesus is, we'll be set up for our tomorrow. If we today, not just, not just in the worship, but if we make a decision, how can we be atten intentional? What that means is, is, you know, what are we reading? What are we reading in our Bible at the moment? You know, what are our commitments? What are our devotional lives? Where are these things at in our commitment? Let me define what this means. To be intentional is literally to do life on purpose. That's what I'm saying, to do life on purpose. In other words, don't let 2018 just roll forward. Be intentional and make it your best year yet. Make it your best year. Determine with all of your heart that in order to transform your life, you're gonna have to meet Jesus at a new level and in a new location and in a new place in the deepest part of your soul. That's what Mary and Martha have to teach us. That, you know, we look at this, you know, in earlier on they had an encounter where they, they had time with Jesus in their house and they were, they were drawing from Jesus. They were intentional in that moment drawing from him so that when the trouble came, they were ready for what needed to happen next. Today in the worship as we pray, today you've come to be in the house of God. That will set you up for an unforeseen challenge in tomorrow. That will set you up in your relationship so you're already prepared. And so I love the principle of being intentional. You know, how do you eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? How do you eat a big problem? How do you eat something that's massive? Well, you eat an elephant one decision at a time. 
one day at a time. You have another crack at it. Tomorrow is another crack. The next day is another crack at it. And you just keep on going. One of the people I love to read, I think is a great thinker. He's dead now, but what he said was amazing is a, is a leader called Jim Rohn. And Jim Rohn said this, he said, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. While failure is simply a few errors in judgment repeated again and again and again. In other words, if we make the right decisions at the start of the day, then we're destined to have a better year. You know, recently I found out that uh, especially young people under the age of 35, which of course I'm in that category, are so addicted to social media that over 50% of people in that age band are waking up in the middle of the night between 12 and 3 a.m. to check their social medias in the middle of the night. Because they're so like addicted to what's going on in the world. They have to be in the clue of what's going on in their social medias. It's like, look at that kind of intentionality. People so addicted in our generation, of course not our young people, our young people are all walking with Jesus and they don't do that. They're just strong in God and we're so grateful for them. But I'm talking about people who are struggling and they don't know where to turn to. And they get hooked on this whole thing about trying to figure out, that, that world teaches us that intentional people can do great things. We see the power of intentionality in sports and in acting and in all these different arts careers. We see the power of intentionality in businesses. We see those principles operating and we see people without God using intentionality to do so much more. And so here's Jesus teaching us that if we're intentional, he's just not promising us our best life. No, he's ready to deliver it to you and I, but we've got to rise up and take it Monday morning. Tuesday morning, Wednesday night at midnight, we've got to rise up and take it and practice that power of intentionality. Let me keep going because this gets so much better as we track the story of how Jesus is interacting. And in this power of intentionality, one of his disciples in verse 16 of chapter 11 says this, this is Thomas. We know Thomas because he's Thomas the doubter. And this is what he says. He says to the rest of his disciples, oh yeah, Let's all go to, to Bethany because we're all going to die there. We might as well all die with Lazarus. What is that about? That's not intentional, but this is what I've learned. I've learned that we should be intentional, but the second tool I want to give you is this, to be honest. Okay, now we're just getting deep now. Now, now here's, here's, here's uh, Thomas. At least he's honest. Someone else might have been thinking it. Maybe Judas was thinking it, but Thomas said it. Thomas brought it out and he said to us, look, we're all going to die there. But the Bible records his statement. If I was Thomas, sorry, Thomas, because I know you're in heaven right now. I'm sure you would love to delete that from the Bible. Make yourself look a little bit better. Take it out and say, I didn't really say that. No, it was Peter. Peter's the one who said all that stuff. It was always Peter who was putting his foot in it. It was always Peter who was the first one to overreact and have anger and all the rest of it. But what I love about this is that Thomas's honesty, Jesus remembered. And later on, towards the end of Thomas's life, after Jesus's resurrection, Jesus has a private appearance with Thomas. And he says, Thomas, touch my hands so that you can feel the nail marks so that you will believe. And Thomas doesn't just live in a place where he's in unbelief, no. He gets intentional, he starts working on his life, and through being honest, he stays tracking with Jesus. Here's what I've decided. As painful sometimes as honesty is, I'm gonna keep being honest and keep being intentional because by that kind of decision, you will be transformed, you will see change, you will see progress. And so this, this honesty, this honesty moment that Jesus encouraged, I think is something that's so missing today in our 21st century and the way we do life. Can we have more honesty in how we feel? And one of the things about doing church here in this part of the world in Yorkshire is that Yorkshire people are honest. Yorkshire people are straight shooters. I like that. I'd rather have that. Being raised in a culture in America where so many people love to hide the truth. Not everybody, I don't wanna you know, bash that nation, but, but you know, 
put filters around it so they can filter it and uh, change things and all the rest. It's like, it's that, that kind of life, if you do that and live that way, you won't, able to, you won't be able to achieve what God has for you. What does the Bible say? It says an honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. Woo. Some of you young people, you can be kissed today by honesty, not by someone of the opposite sex. That's a good thing. What does it say? It says, wounds from a friend are to be trusted. And so, so what you've got to ask yourself is, am I in a company of people? Am I surrounded by people that I can be honest with? Am I surrounded? Am I, am I with people who are godly, who got my back, who step up for me and speak up to me and help me? Because that's an intentional decision that you can make to transform your life and everyone can do it. And I'm not sure you know, that we understand this because honesty does not mean destroying people around you. Honesty doesn't mean, you're ugly. Honesty doesn't mean, oh, you're stupid. Be careful with the words that you choose. Be careful with what you say. James teaches that we have the power of life and death in the tongue. How does Jesus respond to Thomas? He doesn't say anything. He doesn't respond to what Thomas said. He just leaves it hanging. In other words, that Jesus, he knows what Thomas is going through. He knows what you're going through. But Jesus isn't here to judge you. He's here to connect with you and take you on a journey so that you can transform yourself at the outset of 2018. Often we think, oh, we need to stay away from God because if we go back to church, we'll feel convicted and condemned. We'll feel miserable. No, I believe that's a lie from an enemy. Your best life can be when you can be the most honest. When you say, God, I'm stripping away all the masks, all the defense mechanisms. I'm saying, God, I am drawing close to you because if I draw close to you, oh God, you'll draw close to me and together we can move forward. Together we can be a force. Together we can accomplish so much. When we talk about believing, often we think of the size of belief. We think the size of belief as if it were like, some people have little faith and some people have a lot of faith. Jesus talks about faith being like a mountain. But here, I don't wanna focus on this aspect because what I've realized about believing is believing has two aspects. Believing has the decision of what believing is and then believing has the duration of believing. We focus on the decision often of believing, believe in Jesus, but the duration of believing, the time of believing, the length of time of believing is, is what I think Jesus is trying to teach us through this passage. When you go back to verse six, like I already said, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he waited two more days. The God who was and is to come. The power of the risen one. The God who brings the dead things into life. He's the God of miracles, the God of miracles, the God
Thank you so much for watching. We pray to God that you've been impacted by how great God's word is, by how great God's plan is for your life. But I do want to say, if you need prayer for anything, then drop us a line, drop us an email. We would love to hear from you so that we can pray for you and just continue on this journey of building life together. Have a great week, month, year ahead.